Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and this is the Hollow May DAC. This is a $4,200 to $5,600 US dollar piece here. This version right here is the Level 3 or the KTE, meaning Kitsune Tuned Edition, that goes for the full $5,600 US dollars. What's the difference between the $4,200, there's like a $4,700, $4,800 option, and the $5,600 option? Well, upgraded wiring, an improved USB implementation, improved uh, circuit elements like capacitors and like all those kinds of circuit little gizmos in there too. I will leave it to Kitsune's website to explain the differences um, uh, for me. See the link in the description below. No affiliate links this time. The link where you can buy this from uh, Kitsune Audio will be, just be there for your convenience. This unit was a kind loan to me from Ryan at Mod House Audio, so thanks Ryan. And he got the blessing of the folks at Hollow Audio USA to send this to me for review, so thanks to them as well. This unit will be going back to Ryan very shortly, so I will not be keeping it. And as always, all thoughts that you are about to hear on this unit are mine and mine alone. No one has encouraged me to say any particular thing about this unit one way or the other. And if you saw my Hollow Bliss review, which was the aesthetically matching headphone amp to this stack here, and you're a bit worried that I'm going to be, uh, let's say, unenthused on this like I was with the Bliss, Fear not, I think that this is a much more competitive unit at its price point and in its product category than the Bliss was in its uh, at its price and in its product category. And actually, I think um, this is a pretty good unit here overall, and it's got some real strengths when it comes to being able to, high, to handle higher sampling rates. So stick around after shameless self-promotion to hear me say more about all of those things. Hello. I'm one of the reasons that Wave Theory can't spend all of his money on audio gear. He wants you to know that your support is vital for keeping the channel running. So if you enjoy Wave Theory's bussin' review riz and no-cap review style and want to encourage him to stay in the basement so I don't have to listen to his dad jokes as much, like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also send him a donation on PayPal or sign up for the Patreon. Links are in the description. Now on to the review. So the May series of DACs is a fully balanced, discrete resistor ladder design. So you may hear the, the phrase R2R used to describe some uh, DACs out there. For those of you who are new and are just watching this because you're like, wow, why would somebody pay $5,600 for something like this? That just means that instead of a single microchip handling the conversion of the incoming ones and zeros from a binary audio bitstream, and um, there is a, a, an array of resistors in here that are laid out in a geometric pattern, pattern that looks a lot like a ladder. So it's a ladder DAC or an R2R resistor ladder DAC uh, in there. And it's a balanced one at that. So there is an independent array for each channel. All right. Um, and I should drop here that we've got a lot to talk about in this deck, so use the timestamps to move around as you need it and watch the, the parts that are of most relevance and interest to you because this is a resistor ladder deck that is capable of decoding really high sampling rates. Like, theoretically, this can decode up to, I think it's 3072 kilohertz PCM files and DSD 2048, and I forget, I don't know what multiplying factor that is off the top of my head, but the, the Kitsune website states that very clearly, that in theory, this DAC will go that high. But unfortunately, there's no way to actually test that right now, because just about any upsampling or oversampling of option out there these days basically tops out at PCM 1536 and DSD 1024. I was able to test this unit up to PCM 768 and DSD 256, so I will have some thoughts about how this handles really highly upsampled files um, in there here when we get to the sound section. Also, 
There is an oversampling filter in here and a non-oversampling option that goes with it. And so I'm going to unpack a, a little bit about what that means and then also the sonic consequences of having those things on this unit as well when we get to the sound section. There's also seven digital inputs on this thing um, of, a, of a wide variety of types and all of that. And so there is just a lot to get to on this unit. So we are indeed going to be here for a while. Now I'm going to just leave it to you to do your homework on this unit and just read on the Hollow Audio website, which I will link you to, about this unit here because there's just a lot of stuff on there about like um, there specific proprietary circuitry, the differences between the versions and just all of that kind of stuff going on there. So Rather than me just blather on and on and on um, on ad nauseum about all of that, we're going to get into it. So we're going to cut here to a view of uh, a different vantage point so I can show you the build and the features, the back panel, the menu navigation, the remote control, all of that fun stuff. Then we're going to come back on the other side of that and I'll talk about the test gear and the sound. And then I will talk about where I think this fits into the high-end DAC market. Sound good? All right, let's get to it. All right, let's go ahead and take a unit tour and we're going to do this view on the table again because this is a heavy unit together. I'm going from memory. I want to say it weighs about 36 pounds, okay, or close to like 18 kilos, um, which is a mass, not a weight, okay, uh, physics professor. All right, um, and it's the same chassis, okay, same build as the the bliss the the headphone amp from hollow that i reviewed just recently same boxes the lower box here handles power supply the upper box here i believe is the dac and all of the controller controlling and all of that now there might be more divided between the two boxes in there because the umbilical cord and i'll show you that on the back panel in a little bit has a bunch of pins so there might be more talking between these two than just that but the power plug goes into this one and then there's an umbilical cord that runs from here into here all right um, and so it is a two box DAC. It comes in these two boxes like this. The two together are the hollow May. All right. Other than that, like unit two again, same exact same as the Bliss with the, the metal casing here, polished, shiny. There you get the Kitsune Fox head logo on the middle of the back here. This is the KTE version, um, if I haven't said all of that already. In typical, typical hollow fashion, coming off the stand here to show you the side panels, is we have those copper accents there, um, or bronze or like orangish colored, whatever you want to call them there on the side panels, which are not just for aesthetically striking effect. They also help with heat seeking, heat sinking, not heat seeking, excuse me, as far as I know. All right, got to set up my camera again. All right, so let's take a look at the front panel. Push and hold power to get it to cycle on here, and you get a nice big hollow May in LED there as a welcome. And then it'll just probably sit on unlock because I don't have any signal uh, fed into it at all there. But front panel buttons, we have a mute on off, pretty straightforward. Display on off, pretty straightforward. Here you cycle through the digital filtering modes. You see right now it's in NAS, but we have a non oversampling mode. We have, that's display again, I'm, excuse me, okay? We have oversampling, oversampling PCM, oversampling DSD, and then NAS. Okay. So OS means oversampling. What a lot of modern DACs uh, do anymore is they take the incoming signal and then they oversample it. They, in, they I don't want to say interpolate, that's probably not the right word, but they add to the signal, they increase the sampling rate um, by making educated guesses and all of that as to what's going on with the signal. And so, because whatever the DAC architecture is, and again, this is an R2R DAC, but Delta Sigma DACs do the same thing, is they increase the sampling rate so that the internal DAC circuitry can handle the digital to analog conversion a little bit more efficiently. 
All right, does that sound better? Is messing with that signal good? Usually, yes, it's just a, a question of how well it's done. All right, and so what non-oversampling mode means on a DAC like this is it's gonna bypass the internal oversampler, send the incoming ones and zeros from the audio bitstream directly into this case, the resistor ladder for processing and conversion. There are built-in digital oversampling filters on this device, and I just I cycled through them there, showed them to you, okay? Oversampling means that everything that comes in, both PCM and DSD, is just going to be upsampled or oversampled to higher sampling rates before going into the resistor ladder. What OSPCM does is that regardless of whether it's an incoming PCM or DSD signal, it's going to upsample both of them to PCM and then send it through the resistor ladder. So it's going to convert DSD to PCM if it sees that happening. Okay, OSDSD does the exact opposite there, is it takes both PCM and DSD incoming, converts PCM to DSD, and then upsamples everything, but still sends a DSD signal through the resistor ladder. And then NAS does none of those things. It just bypasses that altogether. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about the oversampling filter in here and whether you should use Oz or Nas mode in the sound section because I have some interesting things, or at least I find them interesting things to say when we get to that. All right, source select, and you can see cycling through the sources here, there are a bunch, okay? So it is not short on inputs. I'll show you the back panel here in just a moment. It does come with a remote control. Okay, labeled the RMT-1. Notice it has the same coloring scheme as the DAC itself, and I'm pretty sure those are even the same buttons on there. Um, it's a fairly stripped down remote control. Come on, focus camera. You can uh, do the display dimmer thing here. There's a uh, cycle through the oversampling versus non-oversampling modes here. Mute button, which is pretty straightforward. Cycle the inputs. Okay, uh, select the output, which doesn't do anything on this particular unit here. And then there are volume up and volume down buttons, but those do not work on the May. Those are for other hollow units there that do have a volume control on them. This is just a DAC, it is not a preamp. Okay, digital bitstream in, analog at a fixed volume out, okay, on this unit here. So no volume control from the remote. The remote is small, it's, it's um, toughly built in terms of this little casing here. It's all aluminum and metal, but you hear it. These buttons, these like orange colored buttons, they're just sitting in there and kind of sounds like a baby's rattle. Okay, so these are not in there the best, right? But other than that, it's a functional uh, remote control and all that. And again, no volume control here. You'll either want to connect this to uh, an outboard preamp that can handle volume control or a headphone amp or an integrated amp that has volume control on it if you're going to use speakers or something like that. Okay. That's the front panel of the unit. Let me show you real quick, like there is a menu system here, but to get to it, we've gotta be in standby mode. You may have noticed that this display mode button is also labeled menu. You gotta hold both of these down at the same time, okay? To get into the different um, setup options that are in here, and then you navigate through, okay? With these other buttons, and there's a bunch of different options in here, and like uh, it's, it's one of them here, Okay, is you can change the I squared S pinout configuration, okay, in there, which is helpful. Um, there's this PLL, which I forget what this stands for. You can read uh, Hollow's website and all what that's all about and, and so forth. Um, but that's important because, to get out of this, do we have to stand it by again to get out? I think we may have to do that. Okay, there we go. It's important to point that out because if you use one of the I squared S inputs, and I think this is also true of the SPDIF, um, but definitely happened to me a lot with the I squared S inputs, is if you change the sampling rate of the signal coming in, like if you go from a 44.1 kilohertz file to a 96 kilohertz file in a shuffle or something like that, this from the I squared S input can take 
three to four seconds to really lock in on that new sampling rate. And so you will miss the first few seconds of the song. Now, I didn't actually do it, but I am given to understand that in that menu, in those PLL options, you can change that and like reduce the amount of time it takes to lock in on things. Also, it did not do that from the USB input. If you're gonna connect this via USB, you're good. Okay, it like switched sampling rates basically instantly on that in a, in a shuffle there too. But that's where the menu is, some helpful options in there um, that you can play around with if you are ever to own this DAC. All right, let me flip it around and show you the back panel. Back panel, if we may. Okay, so power input on the what I have stacked is the lower unit here and then I mean it says DC output DC input so definitely power supply going on in the bottom here um, here's the umbilical cord and I don't know if you can see that very well there but there's a lot of pinholes there and focus camera you can do it okay hopefully that's somewhat showing up it's a very proprietary connector lots of pins inside there so i don't know what all of the pins are doing but um there it is the umbilical is probably around a meter long maybe a little bit longer four feet okay ish something like that um so if for whatever reason you can't stack these directly the two boxes directly on top of each other you do have a little bit of leeway in the length of the umbilical there okay Kitsune Tuned Edition, as these stickers point out. So on the DAC itself, one of the things that it's a bit unique that I've not really seen on other DACs is look how far spread out the outputs are. Left channel output, right channel output, and you see that we have both a three pin XLR balanced and then the RCA single ended outputs. Okay, I do recommend the balanced on this um, just because it is a fully balanced unit. So something going to have to happen. Some kind of circuit conjiggering has to happen to be able to use these. All right, then look at all of these input. I mean, we've already seen the DC input, but look at all these digital signal inputs there. There's a lot of them and it's highly flexible. RCA SPDIF coaxial, okay? BNC SPDIF coaxial here, okay? Label is just coax one, coax two. All right, AES input, that is SPDIF over a three pin balanced connector basically, okay? So that's there. Two HDMI style connector for I squared S inputs. These are both I squared S, they are not HDMI arc far as I know. Um, you could argue maybe it should have traded one of the I squared S for HDMI arc, you know, your mileage may vary. Toslink optical SPDIF input here and then the USB input right there, um, all that. So like plenty of options. So, I mean, you can connect one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digital sources to this thing, which is pretty nuts. Um, and that's like one of the largest number of digital inputs of any DAC that I've ever either owned or had come through here for review. So that's nice, but I mean, there it is. That's the back panel. I think that's enough of the unit tour. I mean, well, I mean, like the Bliss, these back corners right here are kind of sharp. So just when you move this thing around, which is hopefully rare, uh, be careful. Those corners are a little bit sharp. But anyway, and, well, and they're heavy. But that's the unit. Let's cut back to me on camera talking about other things of this unit, like the sound. All right, as we turn our attention towards the sonic performance of this uh, unit, let me first mention the test gear here. And I am primarily a headphone user. This being a high-end DAC, um, you probably probably attracted some two-channel audio fans. I do not use speakers as much, mostly because of living situation. Drives my family nuts um, with speakers. So I am primarily a headphone user, and so I listen to this mostly through headphone setups. You can actually see a couple of them right behind me. Okay, hi fi min HE1000 SE further away and then closer to over my shoulder, the hi fi min Susvara, the original anyway. Two of the headphones that I use, but that's only getting started. All right, so let's start with how did I get digital signals into this unit? 
Direct USB connection was one of them to my Microsoft Surface Pro 4 laptop slash tablet, which is a Windows 10 device that would have been used either as a, uh, a Rune endpoint or using Ottervana in there. And uh, Ottervana in particular was the software that I used to send DSD-256 files and up to 768 kilohertz 24-bit PCM files into this unit here. Those higher sampling rate files would have been generated by Pan Galactic Gargle Blaster. I will put a link down in the description for that. What that is is a software option that takes a, um, a 1644.1 file or a 1648 or a 2448 or a 2488.2. It takes a normal sampling rate file Okay, PCM file and up samples it all the way up to 1536 kilohertz, if you wish, at either 16, 24, or 32 bits of bit depth in there. So I put some 24, seven, uh, 705.6, which were multiples of 44.1 kilohertz through here, and also some 768s as well as some 384s, both of which are multiples of, of 48 or 96 kilohertz files through here as well. And then uh, Pan Galactic Gargle Blaster will do the same for DSD files. And so I took some files that were DSD64 originally, which is the, the standard DSD rate, and upsampled them to DSD256 to at least try out some of the upsampling performance with this uh, unit here. But other than that, for non-oversampled files, or just regular raw, if you will, files, they all would have been either lossless or high-res FLAC files, or DSD, standard bitrate DSD files, uh, either played locally or in the case of FLAC files, they could have been streamed from Cobuzz, most of them through Rune using a Rune endpoint, either that Microsoft Surface Pro 4 that I mentioned, or a, a Sonor SU, excuse me, a Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer routed through a Singer SU6 DDC and then I squared S using an AudioQuest Cinnamon. Uh, I squared S cable into one of the I squared S inputs on this unit as well. Okay, then downstream from this, headphone amps, because again, I'm primarily a headphone user. Headphone amps would have included the LTA Z10E, which kind of see right up there behind me. That's going to get a review fairly soon, I hope. Okay. Um, the Vioelectric HPA V281, the Hi-Fi Golden Wave Prelude, the Headamp GSX Mini, and then Hollow's own Bliss headphone amplifier, which was a very recent review. See links in the description for all of that, uh, for my reviews, except for the Z10E, that one's still upcoming. Okay, for all of my reviews of that gear um, that I've done in the past. All right. Headphones that I uh, used, I already mentioned two of them in those two hi fi mins, but also would have included an original Focal Utopia, a Focal Radiance, an Audio Technica ATH ADX 5000, Biodynamic DT880, a uh, headphone he head, headphone two, uh, Focal Utopia, original apologies if I already said that one. They're kind of running, oh, Dan Clark Audio E3. Um, were there others in there? I'm sure, but I think I've got the point across that I used several headphones, all of them pretty high quality in there to really see what makes this DAC tick. All right, so how does this DAC tick? All right, let's, uh, let's get into it. All right. The modes, the, 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 whether you use the NAS mode, the non-oversampling, or you use the onboard digital filtering matters. So I'm gonna start there. I didn't think the onboard oversampling filters were very good, okay? They were a little bit like spatially, they were not like all that holographic in comparison to the NAS. Now, do, is it still a very good sounding DAC with the oversampling, the built-in oversampling filters on it? Yes. Is it necessarily, in this case, a $5,600 DAC with those uh, onboard oversampling filters? I'm gonna say no on that one. Okay, so I thought the oversampling filters like made the sound sharper and harsh and like a little bit sibilant, kind of hurt the spatial presentation a little bit and kind of messed with the attack on some of the transients and all of that, which didn't quite sound natural to me. I was just generally unimpressed with the oversampling filters for a unit of this price here and there. However, the NAS mode on this is wonderful, okay? Um, and that is true regardless of the incoming sampling rate. A DAC that I reviewed previously, the Aqua Lavoce S3, it was also a resistor ladder DAC. 
it was like $4,700, $4,800, something like that. Okay, so it's not way out of the price range of this, this unit here. And it was a NAS only deck. It had no oversampling filter and it needed one. Okay, because on that one, 16-bit uh, 16 44.1 kilohertz, kilohertz PCM files just sounded bad, right? They were harsh, they were sharp and all of that um, on that unit there. So it needed oversampling to sound its best. This one, it does need oversampling to sound its best, but if you don't use oversampling and you just use the NAS mode, 1644.1 on here still sounds pretty good, okay? So you don't need to worry about that, okay? Uh, so the oversampling filters on this are not required, and honestly, I would just leave them off, okay? So all of my thoughts henceforward on this DAC sonically are with the non-oversampling mode enabled. And I'll go ahead and drop the, the, the note right here that if you are going to use externally oversampled files, like from Pangalactic Gargle Blaster, like I did, or if you're a user of Signalist's HQ player, okay, then you're gonna wanna leave this in NAS mode anyway because PGGB, HQP, they are basically doing the job of what the onboard oversampling filters should have been doing anyway. So enabling the NAS mode on this just gets out of the way and doesn't double down and do an, another unnecessary round of oversampling. Okay, so in NAS mode, Let's start with standard sampling rates, meaning 44.1 kilohertz through 192 kilohertz PCM files, or like DSD64, right? Like, so in those kind of more everyday standard sampling rates, what's the performance like? And what's the sound signature like? From a kind of a thousand foot view of the overall frequency response, perceived frequency response of this unit here, I would say it's still mostly neutral. It would fall within the range that most people would consider neutral, but it might tilt just a little bit bright, okay? And I say that because the bass is well extended, but it's not very present, right? There is a bit, at least to these ears, a bit of a roll off in the deep sub bass as compared to some other DACs that I have experience with at a variety of price points here. Um, and so the, the treble does not sound elevated to me, like the air frequencies and all that, everything from say, you know, 100, 120 ish hertz on up sounds like it's pretty flat, okay? Pretty even response all there. The frequency extension is good in both directions, both low and high, okay? But it's, it, the presence of the sub bass does seem to take just a little bit of a step back in comparison with the rest of the frequency spectrum, all that. So that's why I say it is mostly neutral, but just ever so slightly, a, a slight tilt towards brightness. Now. Another way that that slight tilt towards brightness comes out to my ears here is that the tonal balance in the treble is not poor, but it is not exceptional or class leading to these ears. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean the relationships, okay, between the levels of fundamental frequencies and their harmonics are just a little bit off so that things like cymbal crashes and that sort of thing, they just sound a little bit tizzy, uh, a little bit thin to me in comparison to other decks. Now, this is hair splitting, okay? I, I wanna be clear about this. I'm hair splitting here, but it's a $5,600 deck. And if you've hung with me this far into a video and like three years into the life of my channel and the length of videos that I do, you come to me for said hair splitting. So. All right, let's split the hair here. And that like the treble response on this is still quite good in an absolute sense, but I have heard a little bit more natural tonal balance and in the top end from some of the competitors at the price point. And I'll get to some comparisons later on here. Okay, um, but the mid-range tonal balance seems pretty on point. Okay, I, I had less of an issue there. Even the, and then even though the sub bass is a little bit pulled back in presence to my ear, the, um, the, uh, the, the tonal balance for what is there is also fairly natural and accurate to my ears as well. All right, now presentational aspects of this here. 
it has a very big sound, right? This is a very large staging deck. The sense of, of sound stage that it throws out there is definitely on the larger side. It is not the largest piece of, not the largest sounding uh, piece of source gear I've ever heard, but it's near the higher end. Okay, um, on that, or near the larger end, I should say. Of course, it's near the higher end, it's a $5,600 unit. Okay, but it's on the larger side, all right, of the spectrum of units that I have heard there. And it's well balanced in the three dimensions, the width, the depth, and the height. This stands in contrast to my experience with Hollow's Bliss Amp, where I thought the vertical aspects of the, the staging were compressed a little bit, not so here. This one is big, it is spacious, it's expansive, and it is well balanced in all three dimensions in terms of its stage. Now, the imaging, the separation, the layering inside that uh, soundstage is also excellent. It is quite three-dimensional, it is quite holographic. There's a very clear sense of things are here, and things are here, and then there's not things between them, but it does that all with a very natural smoothness and flow to it, and when, without sounding like discrete. Okay, or like points of sound and all of that. It still is well blended together, but still also well separated. And again, in all three dimensions, it manages to do that. Okay, detail retrieval and texturing are also, they're, they're not like light the world on fire good. Like um, it, it, it's not the most resolving DAC I've heard up in this price range, but it's also not the worst. Like the other two that I'm gonna compare it to, the Berkeley Alpha Series 2 here in a moment, and then the Lampazator Baltic 3. All three of those DACs resolve and do detail retrieval at pretty much the same level to my ears here. And so like, again, it's right in there, which tells me that the level of detail retrieval, resolution, texturing, all of that kind of stuff is like right where we should expect it to be for the price point. So, I mean, that's fine too there. I mean, and that's a very high level of resolution, detail retrieval, and texturing, and that sort of thing. All right. It also has a very smooth and very refined presentation. Okay. It's just, it's got a clean, clear, buttoned up, put together, um, I want to say highly polished, but what I mean by highly polished here is that it's just a well-finished sound. It doesn't have a sheen to it or anything like that. It's just, it, it sounds put together, refined, okay, uh, that kind of thing. And it's just, it's got that smooth, like that stereotypical R2R DAC smoothness definitely in here. Okay, so that I appreciated, that was nice. The sonic, the, the noise floor on this thing is basically absent. The sonic background is like black void, but I like how the sounds come and go, like they pop in and out of existence, but they do it in a very natural and organic and believable way. Um, and it doesn't sound distracting to me. Like there are some cheaper gear, like, you know, topping comes to mind where those are very, very quiet, black void sonic background kind of things too, but the way sounds come and go just doesn't really sound natural to me. This solves that, it gives you that really black void sonic background, but a natural way of bringing sounds in and then letting them go. Okay, the decay timing on this unit is pretty good. It sounds like, it does not sound neither wet nor dry to me, it strikes a nice balance of being in the middle here. The attack timing, I've heard better, okay? Um, it's not really a weakness, but like, and this kind of leads into like the dynamics of the presentation too. The hollow sound I'm learning, I've heard the Spring 2 L2 a long time ago, I've now heard the Bliss and now the May, and it seems like the hollow house sound is not overly dynamic or energetic in its presentation. There's a little bit of punch to the mid bass here, but a little bit, it's not super impactful. It's going to be enough for many people, but you know, I like a little bit more. I'm like primarily a, a like a rock and metal kind of listener or big bombastic classical music or orchestral sound works, so, soundtracks kinds of things. So I like a little bit more energy in the presentation and a little bit more impact. Now the slam 
how hard it hits in the sub bass is below average, I would say, just because that sub bass roll off comes in a little bit. And then it's also doubled down on the fact that like things like a bass guitar, string plucks and kick drums and all of that don't have all that satisfying of a, of a weight and impact to them coming in there. So you combine like a little bit, like not squelched, but just not emphasized dynamic uh, presentation here. And then the attack timing is just, just a hair fuzzy to my ear ears on this. The decay timing is good. The attack timing is just a little bit off for me. So it just sounds a little bit splashy. There's just not a nice clean edge, leading edge to things as much as I would like, particularly at $5,600 here. Okay, so that to me is just like one aspect for my ears. I would like a little bit more, but I mean, your mileage may vary on there. It's certainly not poor. I could definitely still enjoy me listening to music through this unit a lot, okay, um, with the right amps, which we'll get to, okay, uh, but it, you know, that's just one aspect of it that I noticed there. Another, like, nitpick that I'm going to have here is it does have a little bit of leanness to the weight of the sound. Part of it is because of the, sl the slightly rolled off uh, sub bass here and, like, just not a lot of slam. But it also is like, you know, that tonal balance that I mentioned and the treble a little bit, it does make this, the tonal weight and density seem a little bit thin. And that is through the, the whole frequency spectrum. Again, it's not poor and it's not bad. It's not going to be a deal breaker for many, but because you're coming to me for that hair splitting, I'm splitting the hairs here. And I'm saying that the, there, there are other DACs that I've heard, both at this price and below, that flesh out the weight of the tones a little bit better and just gives the sound a little bit more fullness and body. Okay, so this is a little bit on the thinner side, a little bit on the leaner side in terms of that presentation. Okay, so again, this is all with standard sampling rates that we're still talking here. Strengths of this unit are its spatial presentation and how big and three-dimensional and holographic and realistic the, the spatial presentation is, the resolution, the texturing, the detail retrieval, both the amount and the way it's presented. It's neither, it's neither too forward nor too pulled back. Also strengths of this unit, okay? Very clean, very quiet, very refined, smooth, buttoned up, well put together sound. Okay, also a strength. Some of the weaknesses to my ears, a little bit reserved sub bass, a little bit dynamically, um, not squelched, but just the dynamics are a little bit more subdued on this. There's not a whole lot of slam there. Um, and then the, just the overall weight and body to the tone of the sound is a little bit on the lean side and the treble balance, the tonal balance in the treble is just a little bit thin, okay? Just a little bit brittle, but it manages to not be harsh or sibilant at, um, at the same time there, okay? So those are like the, the takeaways for me when we're talking about standard sampling rates. What happened with those really high sampling rate files? Because that's one of the features of this DAC, and so we need to talk about that. It wakes up a little bit. What I noticed here is like when I went from standard sampling rate files like, and then to the higher stuff, and I have several tracks where I have like the original 44.1 or the original 96 or the original DSD 64, and then those same files were up or upsampled to 384, 705.6, 7768, whatever the case may be, right? Uh, what I noticed is that when I'd go from the lower to the higher, it didn't make a huge difference right away. I noticed a little bit of enhanced smoothness, a little, you know, yet a little bit more clarity, a little bit more openness to it. Uh, to the sound uh, on it there, and a little bit more dynamic impact. I think the higher sampling rates do help with the dynamic presentation here. It's never going to be a slammer. Like, it is just never going to hit with a whole lot of impact. It's just not in its nature to do that. But it does step forward a little bit in the dynamics with those higher sampling rates. 
Where I notice the bigger difference though is if I go from the 384 or the 768 or the 705.6 or the DSD 256, whatever the case may be, back down to the original 44196 or DSD 64 file, okay? When I drop back down like that, what I would perceive is like, okay, now I'm missing stuff. It would sound like those lower sample rate files now had like a veil to them that I just, I was tempted to crank up the volume because it just sounded like things were now missing. Okay. And then this is also where I would really notice that there was improved um, smoothness and like less fatigue with the higher sampling rates. Uh, one that one track that stands out that I used to test here is Numa by Tool, which is on the Fear Inoculum album. And this was just going from the original 2496 to an upsampled 24384 file here. And I listened to the 384 first and like, you know, just and just it was so smooth. And like that's a very aggressive track. Um, who's the guitarist for Tool? Is it Adam Jones? Is that the name? Sorry if that's not the name. But the way he tunes his guitars is they tend to be very aggressive, a little bit higher in the mids, right? Like like the way he tunes his guitars is not like a new metal band that turn, tunes it way down to, into like drop D or something like that, where it's a really low, chunky sound. This is like a higher, like more piercing kind of sound to his distorted electric guitars. And he plays aggressively because, I mean, it's a metal band, right? And what I noticed is like on the 384 files, like I could really push the volume to probably unsafe levels that I shouldn't have done. And it was still nice and smooth and non-fatiguing. But when I dropped down to the 96, the original 96 file, I immediately had to turn the volume back down because I was hearing harshness and a little bit of grain in that sound as well through here. So like the step up to the higher sampling rate does really help here. And again, I notice it more going from high to low rather than going from low to high, but a little bit more detail comes out, a little bit more resolution comes out. There's a small, a subtle, but noticeable improvement in the dynamics and in the impact of the sound. The tonal weight comes back a little bit, but not a lot. So again, it takes a step forward there. But you really, like these ears anyway, really did miss a lot of what was going on with the higher sampling rates when I'd go from the high to the low. So I think the value of this DAC, and I know some people are just gonna scoff at the idea of talking about value at $5,600, but one of the real values of this piece is its ability to handle those really highly oversampled files and allow you to use Pan Galactic Gargle Blaster or HQ Player or any of those and get a real sonic benefit from them. Okay, so that's one of the key features of this DAC that one should keep in mind if they're considering buying this and are going to build a system around it. Okay, shall we talk about system building then? I think so, let's get to it. Okay, so as I mentioned on here, this is not a particularly dynamic amp and it leans just a little bit brighter in its overall signature to my ears here. I personally think it is best paired with an amplifier that's going to have a little bit warmer, thicker, fuller sound, and is gonna bring in a little bit more dynamics and slam. As a proof of concept of that, I thought my Vioelectric HPA V281, which is a warmer, thicker, definitely dynamically engaging, particularly in the low end with a fair amount of slam, okay, and it's got a little bit thicker overall tone to its sound, that, was a pretty good match to the Maydac here. Like it helped balance out the slightly leaner, thinner, brighter sound and like slightly dynamically subdued sound, brought some of that back in with the sound there. The LTA Z10E, which you see right back there, is also a really good match as long as you are comfortable with the fact that like that's not going to help recover the sub bass for you and it's not going to bring forth the dynamics as much as something like the Vio does. I wish that I had it in still. I didn't. I had to go back to the friend who lent it to me, but the Nimbus HPA US5 Pro, which is made by the same people who make Vioelectric, Lake people, okay, had that warmer, thicker, fuller, more impactful sound on it too. And I thought like, and I'm guessing educated guess here i can't confirm it odd synergies can still happen but i am guessing that that would also be a really good match to this deck here as well and be on a technical level that's a little bit closer to it than what the v281 was 
The uh, the prelude that I mentioned there um, did bring back some of the warmth and the fullness and the thickness a little bit, not as much as the Vio did. And then unfortunately, the Bliss amp, also by Hollow, while it visually and aesthetically matches this stack, just sonically kind of doubles down on some of the issues here. Like it's pretty clear that the hollow house sound is just a little bit thinner and leaner in its presentation, which doesn't really work for me. And like putting thin and lean with thin and lean was just kind of doubling down on some of the issues. Then also dynamically subdued, putting so dynamically subdued with dynamically subdued just was a sound that I personally didn't really like all that much. And so, I mean, I recommend using a warmer, thicker, slammier, more dynamically impactful amp with the May. Okay. Um, and that can also go for headphones. Like if uh, the, the Focal Utopia sounded fine with the right amp in between these, and that's a very dynamically active headphones so that helped a little bit too. Um, but uh, headphones like the Head Headphone 2, which all has a little bit of dynamic impact on it to begin with and is also a little bit leaner in the sub bass, not the best match to this sound here either. So, I mean, you can help some of its relative, and again, I stress relative here because on an absolute sense, I don't know that I would call them weaknesses, but the relative weaknesses to these ears here can be mitigated somewhat with careful signal chain building up here. And really when you're up at this price, Synergy carries the day on a lot of these things. Uh, anyway, you know, second only to personal preference. Okay. Let's talk quickly then about some comparisons and like why I say that this fits in the market where it does in terms of resolution and all of that. I am the owner of an Al a Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC and a Lampazator Baltic 3. I have had the Berkeley Alpha Series 2 for a very long time now as my reference DAC. Most of the time I've had it, it was paired with the Vioelectric HPA V281 because that is a very neutral and incisive DAC. See my review for it in the link down in the description to get a more thorough explanation of its sound. Okay, but that was also a case where like the, the more neutral and incisive sound needed just a little bit more filling out with the tonal weight. And so like, that's what the Vio was for. But the Berkeley still sounds great with that Z10E behind me, but it's just more like neutral on neutral. The Baltic 3 I brought in, kind of see it, it's the one with the tubes in it right there, okay? Um, that one I brought in because the, the Lampazator sound is a little bit warmer to begin with, and it is thicker, it is fuller, and it is very impactful. That Baltic 3 has a very robust, uh, present, and like impactful sub bass to it. Okay, and so like because that Z10E back behind me is like neutral and like doesn't enhance really anything, it just lets the DAC do its job, I wanted that warmer, thicker, fuller, more impactful sound to go into that as another option. Okay, and I will try to do a video to more fully flesh out the Baltic 3 sound in the near future so that like this comparison will mean even more when you see that there. But as I mentioned earlier, the detail retrieval, the resolution, on the May DAC is like right there with the Berkeley and with the Baltic. If they are different in their resolution and detail retrieval prowesses, prowesses, is that even a word? Anyway, it's very, very narrow. And I like, I looked all the way through my notes when I was comparing these things and I really never commented a whole lot on resolution or detail retrieval differences. They just didn't stand out to me particularly when this one here was in its uh, standard sampling rate mode, it gets maybe just the slightest of edges, maybe, maybe, okay? Um, in resolution and detail retrieval when it's talking about oversampled files, but even then I'm not enough for me to say confidently that it definitely outresolves those other two DACs. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Alpha S2 comes pretty close to the May in terms of soundstage size, the Baltic is not quite as big as these two on there. So the combination of the Baltic being warmer and fuller and just a little bit smaller in its soundstage, I think some would interpret that as being overall congested. I don't think it's congested. I just think that like the, it just sounds a little bit more close in just because it's not as big of a stager and then it's warm, thick and full and impactful. Where the really big soundstage size from the May 
kind of emphasizes the ability to separate sounds a little bit too. So it just kind of spreads everything out a little bit, which is not unnatural or unrealistic. It's just a little bit different than particularly the Baltic and just a little bit more than the Alpha, though the Alpha gets closer to the, uh, the, the May here in that regard, okay? But all three of them are well balanced in all three dimensions of the, uh, the, the sound staging. The length or the width, the depth, and the height, they're all fairly three-dimensional and well balanced that way. Though I do think the May at times may have the clearest sense of depth and particularly layering. But again, splitting hairs, okay? You come to me to split those hairs and here I am splitting them. And by hair splitting difference, the May might have a little bit more depth and layering to its soundstage than those other two. The Alpha and especially the Baltic though are more dynamically engaging, more dynamically impactful, more dynamically lively than this. They never sound dynamically subdued where this one does. And then there's the issue of like that tonally lean sound on the, the May here. The Alpha is probably, the, al the Alpha is definitely a little bit fuller and then the Alpha does not uh, suffer from that sub-bass roll-off. It doesn't emphasize the sub-bass a little bit like the Baltic does, but it doesn't have the roll-off that the May does. It's a little bit more linear on that there. But like the Alpha is like the next most lean or the, like the step up from this one in terms of that tonal weight and fullness. And the Alpha has never stood out to me as being all that tonally full or, or having a whole lot of weight to it or a whole lot of density to the sound, but it's got more than the May does. And then the Baltic puts them both to shame in, in that regard where it just sounds very thick and full in there too. Now, all three DACs, the Alpha S2, the Baltic 3, and then of course the May KT, KTE here, which is the subject of this review, sound great. Okay, they are all going to make the right user for them very happy. All right, they just are going to have a little bit different characters and presentations to their sound, which if you're about to spend, you know, $5,600 to $7,000 on a DAC, you have every right to know about before you give them your credit card number. All right, so let's wrap this up a little bit. Hollow May KTE. I, I am going to put it as one of my recommended components. Um, it's probably not my personal favorite up in this price range, just because I'll run through like my perceived weaknesses of it here in that it's got a little bit rolled off and um, like pulled back sub bass a little bit. It's got a little bit subdued dynamics. I don't really love the attack timing on that. It sounds just a little bit fuzzy on the leading edges of tones to me. Um, and then it also just has an overall like lean sound to it. Like, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like with the, you know, real quick back to the, the Berkeley Alpha and the, Balt the Lampazator Baltic 3, like treble hits, like cymbal hits on those two have like a tang to them, whereas the May has a ting to the sound there. So is tang accurate or is ting accurate is up to you, but I preferred the tang. The ting just sounded a little bit thin to me. Hi-hat hits, if someone rides the hi-hat a little bit, that can start to sound shishy on this DAC, whereas on the other two, it sounded a little bit more shushy, okay? Just kind of like just a little bit more weight and fullness to the other two. So that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. But back to the wrap-up here. So the slightly uh, subdued dynamics, the rolled off sub bass, and then just the overall like thinness and leanness to the tone means that I probably wouldn't choose this DAC as my day-to-day, -day, everyday reference DAC. However, there are going to be many who will choose it because it has some very real strengths that it does very well. One of them is handling uh, oversampled files incredibly well and that helping the sound and that's going to be a selling point for a lot of people. So if you like Pangalactic Gargle Blaster or HiQ player, or HiQ, sure, HQ player, okay, this is really one of the better options out there for that price point. But many are gonna love the smoothness and the refinement uh, in this sound. They're gonna love how dark the sonic background is, the overall cleanliness and clarity to the sound, okay? And then also like the big staging and just the really well-balanced three-dimensional and holographic spatial presentation on this, which is a true strength of this deck as well. And then also just, it's got a ton of digital inputs. If you have a lot of digital source gear, Okay, those other two that I mentioned, the Alpha and the Baltic 3, they're a little bit limited both on input option types and quantity. This one really isn't. It's got all the bases covered there. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there then. I am Wave Theory. This has been my review of the Hollow May KTE uh, deck. It's good. Okay, it's pretty good. All right, uh, please remember to like, subscribe, and comment. If you haven't already, check out my PayPal and my Patreon, and generally do those things you do to support YouTube channels. And as always, enjoy the music.